you got a little bit of an introduction to the Birmingham Oratory. And uh, Father Duffield has been, has very graciously uh, reserved uh, seats for uh, yeah, uh, yeah, for pilgrimage that we're conducting to the Beatification in September. Uh, so you're certainly all welcome to join us. We will be visiting the oratory as well. And that information is in the registration packets that you receive. Um, without uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce with great admiration, Father Richard Duncan. Thank you. Patrick, thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction. I don't recognize myself at all. Thank you, Thanks. I Can you hear me? No. Right. I mean, I'm probably right there. Is that better? Yeah. I just thank Pat for his generous introduction and I slightly really recognize myself, but uh, thank you, Mom, as Patrick. I would also like to thank the Portsmouth Institute for inviting me to take part in this wonderful conference and to speak to you a little bit about the physical legacy of John Henry Newman at the Birmingham Oratory. But before I do, I would like to say how much I feel at home here, and thank you to Father Abbott and to the monks of Portsmouth Abbey for making us so welcome. Having spent 10 formative years of my own life in a beautiful but exceptionally chilly valley, valley with a monastery and school in the North Riding of Yorkshire, I find that Portsmouth Abbey is ample forth with added comforts. <laughs> and so far at least nobody has sent me on a punishment run <laughs> or in an absolute desperation picked me for a house rugby 15. <laughs> they would really have to be desperate now. I think Newman would have been embarrassed by the very thought of having a conference devoted to his own life and thought. He was horrified by his own reputation for sanctity. I have nothing of the saint about me, as everyone knows, he said, and it is a severe and salutary mortification to be thought next door to one. <laughs> but if there must be such a conference, then perhaps he would have said that a Benedictine monastery is the good place to do it. In 1879, the English Benedictine congregation to which this monastery belongs sent a formal letter of congratulation to the newly created cardinal. They admired him, they said, like another St. Bede. You have loved to do your great intellectual work in retirement, and have been reluctant that any event should call you forth from your truly monastic cell. The cardinal replied, there are none whose praise is more welcome to me than that of Benedictines. Newman was not a man for insincere compliments. I'm sure his pleasure was entirely genuine. Some 20 years earlier, he had himself written extensively in praise of the Benedictine charism. There have been great religious orders since whose atmosphere has been conflict and who have thriven in smiting or in being smitten. It has been their high calling it has been their peculiar, meritorious service. But as for the Benedictine, the very air he breathes is peace. Of course, peace for Newman was an ambivalent gift. One of the mottos by which he lived his life from his adolescence was holiness rather than peace. Peace is not simply quiet at any cost but the fruit of a life of fidelity to the truth. So in the exchange of compliments, though wholly sincere, there is nevertheless some misunderstanding. Newman, although he was leading a rather quiet life by 1879, when he became a cardinal, had never lived wholly in retirement or been afraid of conflict. He had founded two oratories, a school and a university, he had engaged in controversy with some of the great minds of the day, while not having, say, Manning's engagement in public affairs. Nevertheless, he had known what it is to struggle in the world. If by 1879 he had found some peace 
in their entire life, it has come at some cost. For his part, Newman admired the Benedictine contemplative spirit, the scholarship, and that tradition of meditative penetration to the very soul of the words of Scripture and of his beloved father of the Church. But in 1879, the English Benedictines had returned to the missionary roots established by St. Gregory and Augustine and were running parishes and schools like this one here in Portsmouth. As a teenager, I shared the same buildings as a school of 800 boys and a monastery of 60 monks. The air we breathed was not peace. <laughs> Newman's view of the monk had more than a little Victorian romanticism about it. But the misunderstanding is revealing. In their wholly sincere admiration for each other, we can understand the peace that both monks and cardinal aspire to. It is an aspiration we share. Not an empty peace that is merely quiet or the absence of noise or argument. Rather the peace that comes from prayer. The peace that comes from the search for truth in scripture and tradition. And the deep peace that only comes after a life of sincere struggle to live in accordance with that truth. A peace, in short, which is the fruit of holiness. I would like to make use of this occasion to convince you of the importance of preserving the physical legacy of John Henry Newman in the form of his manuscripts, letters and diaries. And you saw from the wonderful film that they are in some need of preservation. And I would like to persuade you in addition that they should be preserved intact in the place where John Henry Newman made his home, the Birmingham Oratory. And I'm very grateful, as I've said, to the Cardinal Newman Society for all they have done to help us promote this work in the United States. I'd like to begin, this may seem slightly tangential, by describing a political situation connected with our recent general election campaign. In the United Kingdom, as soon as an election is called, Dozens of bills are rushed through Parliament to dissolve. We call it doing the washing up. <laughs> to get these bills through quickly, all their controversial elements are dropped. And one such bill was the Personal, Social and Health Education Bill. It proposed, among other things, some changes to our national curriculum. Children as young as 11 were to be taught about contraception and abortion, how to access contraception and abortion, and that same-sex unions are of equal status with traditional marriage within British society. You may be surprised to hear that the bishops of England and Wales were supportive of this bill. Not, of course, because they supported those elements I just described, but because the Catholic Education Service, an organ of the Bishops' Conference, had negotiated an agreement with the government that the bill would have Catholic support if it contained an amendment to the effect the Catholic schools would teach these things if they could also go on to teach but the Catholic judge believes they're wrong. One of my confreres in the oratory summed up this absurdity with the following parallel. It is as if the government were to say that the schools can teach that racism is morally wrong, but were then to legislate that, in the interest of conveying a balanced account of the facts, they also had to explain that racism can be thought morally acceptable and inform children where they can access racist literature, attend racist meetings, join a racist political party, and how to put racism into practice on the streets. In short, we would have been obliged to teach our children how to commit the sins before we teach them that the sins are wrong. The controversial elements of the bill were not dropped because of the principal opposition to church, but simply because of a shortage of parliamentary time. Against the background of these controversial issues, we in the oratory had to appoint new governors to our primary school, governors who can be relied upon to support the orthodox Catholic position of the oratory in battles such as these. 